There's also a donation box, box <laughs> that enables them to bring you these nice lectures. So be generous. Anything else? You may start. Okay, thanks, sir. <laughs> thanks. Give her the throne and she takes over. Give her the throne and she takes over. Are you ready for me to talk? Uh -huh. yep. yep. All right. <clears throat> when I laid these notes down, it reminded me of a story about a jack leg preacher in the Foshi Valley. Some of you know what I mean by a jack leg preacher. In pioneer days, that meant one of limited ability and depth of perception. <clears throat> this old boy, as he used to say, had been off and heard a preacher declaiming from a text. Well, he was deeply impressed by that. So when he got to his next assignment in the Foshi River Valley, he said, after reading a lengthy chapter of the New Testament, Brothers and sisters, that there was my text. I may never get back to it, and neither does it make any difference. <laughs> I hope to do a little better than that. <laughs> First of all, pronunciation. Down in central Arkansas, there is a river of the same spelling called the Fush. And I'm sure the original French trapper sure called it the Fourche. And it looks like Fourche now. But in this presentation, and here and after, as far as I'm concerned, it'll be Foshi. <laughs> because our forebears called it Foshi. I grew up hearing Foshi. And I spent over 50 years going down the Foshi and the John boat, so I think I know it well. <coughs> the stream begins west of Donovan. Three branches, they come together just before the state line and enter Arkansas north of Middlebrook. It's a gravel and rock bottom fast moving stream up there, noted for smallmouth bass, suckers, and red horse. When you get down around uh, Jarrett, Highway 328, where I live, it is taking on something of the character of a lowland stream. And from Engelberg on down to Black River, it is a classic lowland river. So the flow changes character as you go down the river. I will tell you something that doesn't sound reasonable to you if you look at a map. It is a hard six-day float from the state line to Black River. I have made it many times, and it is definitely a hard six-day float. The river has so many twists and bends and stopped up with so many trees and uh, other debris that it takes that long. The first really permanent settlement in the Foshi Valley was at Columbia, which is near where the Columbia Jarrett Church Building is now. Before it was called Columbia, it was called Forche du Mans, or Forche de Thomas, by the French explorers. Now, our good old boy ancestors that came out of Kentucky and Tennessee didn't fool with any of that Forche du Mans stuff. They called it Forche from then till now, I'm sure. The people started coming right after the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. They crossed Current River at Pittman's Ferry and began to settle the Foshi River Valley. For a time, Columbia was a rival to Davidsonville. Columbia was a thriving settlement, and it bid to be one of the leading communities in Randolph County, which was then a part of Missouri Territory. Arkansas didn't become a state until 1836. The early settlers were the Fletcher, Lindsay and Jared families. I think the Lindsays, Billy, are your ancestors? That's the same Lindsays, is it not? And Hatch, too. <laughs> well, yes, it was Carolina. <laughs> <Lindsay and Lindsay. laughs> Absolutely. Caleb Lindsay and some others established these old Salem Baptist Church. Some Baptist historians think they were meeting as early as 1798 but it is documented 
that there was a Baptist church at what we now think of as Columbia Jarrett in 1818, and of course they are meeting there today. This is well documented to be the oldest Baptist church in the state of Arkansas. When Arkansas became a state, each county had to establish a county seat. Well, there were two polling places, Columbia and Bettis Bluff. Bettis Bluff was, of course, Pocahontas as we know it now. And you could be polled in either place, the story goes. Thomas Drew and Ransom Bettis decided that they had a plan to make Bettis Bluff the county seat. They threw a barbecue and I'm told served large amounts of strong drink. <laughs> Being the better politicians, they drew the bigger crowd, polled the highest vote, and therefore Pocahontas is the county seat rather than Columbia Jarrett. <laughs> Some of the old timers out there said Pocahontas is not named right. And it's not Pocahontas, it's Poke it on to us the way they did it. <laughs> Most Randolph County people are unaware of the Foshi Valley's gateway status. It was the first area of permanent settlement west of the Mississippi River going down the old southwest trail toward Louisiana and Texas and further west. Well, why was this the case? The lowlands, what we think of as the bottoms today from Black River on all down the Mississippi River, was largely undrained swamps and sloughs and malaria and mosquitoes and it wasn't suited for agriculture or human habitation right, at that time. But the upland valleys like the Foshi and the Eleven Point were well suited for agriculture and they were out of the mosquitoes and the malaria of the Delta and the farmlands in those valleys were rather rich. The migration pattern was much the same where these people came from. Most were out of the British Isles, a few from Germany. They had settled on the eastern seaboard, Virginia or one of the Carolinas, and they progressively moved westward in an advancing frontier. Generally, they stayed in the upland from the Carolinas and Virginia across Tennessee and Kentucky and then live for a brief period of time possibly in southeast Missouri and then cross Pittman's Ferry into Randolph County. <coughs> Some of the earliest <coughs> settlers were John Shaver and Matthias Mock in the Palestine area. Now John Shaver is my ancestor, so that makes our family here 202 years. So we got here in 1815. <coughs> Matthias Mark was his son-in-law. We said that Columbia Jarrett was the oldest documented Baptist church in Arkansas. The Palestine Church of Christ is one of the very first of that faith. According to Lawrence Dalton's history, and the researches of my cousin, Dr. Michael Wilson. They were meeting there as early as 1825. So this is one of the first of that group west of the Mississippi River. James Bigger and the Sweezes came here from Wayne County, Missouri in 1827. James was the ancestor of a tremendous number. Randolph County people. I'll go ahead and tell it, Jake. Frank Bigger isn't here to contradict us. <laughs> <coughs> He's, uh, he wouldn't anyway. <coughs> James Bigger is my ancestor, and Brian Elmers, and Jake Foster, and I don't see anybody else in the crowd, but the four of my sister are direct descendants of James Bigger. But he left here in 1820s, no, he left here in uh, 1834 in the heat of the night because he had beaten the slaves to death and had to betake himself to Texas. There is a great number of biggers in East Texas today that are of our stock of people that 
County, Tennessee in 1820. If you're going north on 251 toward Warm Springs, you cross a creek called Tennessee Creek. That is named Tennessee Creek because the Spikes family was the first to settle on that creek. And they came here from Hawkins County, Tennessee. Now there's an interesting corollary here the Stubblefields, Rices, and Looney's, who were the first families in the Eleven Point River Valley. William Looney got here in 1802, I think it was, he and three slave boys. And then a wagon train of Stubblefields, Rices, and Looney's came in 1812. And they too came from Hawkins County, Tennessee. So Hawkins County was definitely a seedbed for the settlement of Randolph County, Arkansas. William Russell came here about 1815. He had the first court in the state of Arkansas. The court building would have been north of Attica, where Ronald Riggs lives today, where Judge Mack Riggs lived a few years ago. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Henry Waddle, uh, another ancestor of, of mine, and Brian Alders came here in 1832 from Sullivan County, Tennessee. His father, Jacob, was killed at the Battle of Fort Niagara in the War of 1812. His wife took half pay for five years and somehow found her way to the Palestine community of Randolph County, Arkansas. Literally hundreds of us are descended from Henry Waddle. A fellow from all asked one of my cousins once, said, why is it that every time I mention anybody's name in Randolph County, the person said, well, yes, he's my cousin. <laughs> my cousin explained it to him thusly. Our grandfather had six sisters. They all married men in the Maynard School District. Two of them married a second time, and he had two brothers. They're descendants of all eight unions in the Maynard School District today. So the kinship networks in the Foshi Valley become very intertwined and complex. A major reason being how long people have been here. All these people I'm naming, if you'll count it up, have been here from over 200 years to 180 years. And many of those families have interacted and intermarried during all of those years. So a lot of us are a little bit kin, as we used to say. A man named Jesse Johnson, a horse trader from down around St. Francis County in the Delta, Forest City area, came here in about 1830. Interesting tale that goes with Jesse Johnson. I have a great-grandfather that we were always told was half Cherokee and that he was brought here by Jesse Johnson, the horse trader. Well, James Johnson, who lives in Ripley County, just north of Maynard, told me the story from the Johnson family perspective. Jesse got involved in a shootout with an Indian camp at Cherry Valley, south of Jonesboro. And in the shooting, Franklin Hawk, my great-grandfather's parents, were both killed, and he brought the boy home with him. Well, the boy eventually married Margaret Lucretia, Aunt Queen Waddle, they called her my great-grandmother. But where this gets more interesting is that Jesse Johnson is one of my ancestors, a great-great-grandfather, on the shaver side. If the two stories are correct, I had one great-great-grandfather that shot and killed another set of great-great-grandparents. I have no reason to believe it is, is not true. But the Arkansas frontier was a very different world than any of us can imagine from what we have experienced in our time. We need to talk a little about the Lindsayville Cemetery. The Lindsayville Cemetery is three miles west of Maynard 
of a Vern Weisenbaugh farm today. Some of the very earliest settlers are buried there. Some of you will recognize the name John Gould Fletcher, the poet laureate of the state of Arkansas. His uncle, also named John Gould Fletcher, is buried at Lindsayville. John Gould had a brother named Richard Fletcher, who was a revolutionary soldier, and he is buried at Lindsayville. The families at Lindsayville were at the Watauga settlement in East Tennessee that, if you're a real history buff, that may register with you. That was one of the first settlements west of the Appalachians as the pioneers <coughs> progressed westward. So they were instrumental in the Watauga settlement, the Lindsays and Fletchers. And they also came to the Columbia Jarrett community, and many of them were buried at Lindsayville. I was aimed to bring one of my books and read an excerpt about a celebration on July 4th, 1821 at Columbia, but I remember the essence of it, I think. They erected a great liberty pole higher than any of the surrounding trees. A man named Jacob Shaver put them through their military tactics and marches, and a man named William Plot, I think, invited the whole group to his home for a barbecue dinner. And the part that interested me was the familiarity of the names. The dinner was presided over by Matthias Mock, William Jarrett, and Dr. Pitney. Well, all of those names are still with us today. And uh, they were the prominent people then. Made me think of a corollary that I didn't have in my notes. 1851, Dr. William Jarrett, the one who brought the Jarrett family here from North Carolina about 1820. I've seen his sale bill after his death in 1851. And I broke out with great amusement when I looked at the first two names that owed Dr. Jarrett money. Some of the same two names in our time that are legendary for owing people money. 150 years ago, the pattern was there. They were in bed to Dr. Jerry. Let's take another tack and just start down the river. And I'll name some places and relate any stories that seem pertinent. I need to define terms, most of all, because everybody wasn't raised on a river and used to these things like I am. A hole. Let me just see, how many of you would know what I mean by a hole in reference to a river? Yeah, half or more. It's a long, deep stretch of the river. A shoal. How many of you know what a shoal is? Yeah, about the same half. <laughs> Uh, this is a gravel bar, swift place on either end of a hole. A ford is the th third reference I will make. And a ford was the place where the, the pioneer families crossed the river. If they farmed on both sides or just traveled between two communities. As you float the river, in my time, you could see the indentation in the banks where that for generations they had crossed the river by horse and wagon. And these fords all had a name, depending on which pioneer families lived in the area. The first hole is the Ader Hole, A-T-O-R, named after a man with the unlikely name of Pharaoh Ader. <laughs> but he was a Tennessee Confederate, I think, that moved there just after the Civil War. At the lower end of the Ader Hole is the Smith Ford, named after Caswell Pinckney Smith. Uncle Pink, they called him. I was hoping Ann would be here to see if she remembered Uncle Pink Smith's daughter. I'll bet she does. But anyway, first of all, Uncle Pink settled on the west side of Foshi because he had shot and killed a black man in Tennessee that was robbing his store. And he reasoned that if he was on the west side of Foshi, he might 
come less near being apprehended or questioned by the law. Uncle Pink had a daughter named Bertie Caldwell. Some of you remember Bertie? Okay, that was Uncle Pink Smith's daughter. I won't go in depth describing Bertie, but I'll give you one memory. When she was well into her 80s, she would put on a long dress, gloves up past her elbows, carry a parasol, walk up and down the streets of Maynard, and say, I'm going to get out from here and amount to something. I'm not going to stay in this place my whole life. <laughs> the next uh, hole down the river was called the tie yard hole. Many people rafted ties down the river to make part of their living then, and this is where they gathered them up. The next ford is called the Odom Ford. Some of you remember Leo Odom, I'm sure a dog trainer and longtime resident of the Middlebrook area. Well, there's a story that goes with the Odoms and a great many other people that is very, very unique. There were about eight to ten families <clears throat> that came to the area between Maynard and the state line from McNary and Benton County, Tennessee during Reconstruction. In effect, they moved an entire Tennessee community by wagon train to the northern part of Randolph County. The Smiths, the Joneses, the Spencers, the Spences, the Hatleys, the Swindles, the Johnstons, all came to Randolph County together and settled between <clears throat> Maynard and the state line in the 1870s and they basically all were in the same community in Tennessee and some already intermarried before they came here. So they moved an entire Tennessee community to that part of Randolph County. Bill Swindles Ford is the next down the river. Many of you will remember Bill, the Pioneer Day auctioneer. Classic good old boy, tireless bird hunter, had a rural sense of humor that wouldn't quit. I'm trying to think of a Bill Swindle story that would do to tell. <laughs> School board. Yeah, meeting. here's one. Uh, we were having a banquet at Maynard. Bill was on school board. We had an entertainer that was from off. Not really familiar with the local culture. And she sang some vaudeville numbers that had some four-letter words in them. You could see eyebrows raising amongst the fundamentalists all around the banquet hall. <laughs> Bill Swindle looked over at me and he said, Sue, with a, just a little encouragement, that old gal would jitterbug right here in Maine. <laughs> William Swindle, for whom the Ford, actually the Swindle, uh, Bill Swindle was named, was captured at Salon Church during the Civil War. The Methodist Church at Salon is one of the ancient churches with ancient burial grounds of Randolph County. Uh, Daniel Rapert, Bill Rapert's ancestor, and uh, William Swindle. Uh, Larkin Johnston was captured. Some of you are old enough to remember Larkin Johnston, the Middlebrook Methodist preacher. Anne would remember him, I'm sure. But anyway, this Larkin Johnston was named for him. Then we come down the river just north of the Middlebrook Bridge to McElrath Smith. A uh, family named Rock McElrath established a mill there in the 1850s. The last time I floated that stretch, you could still see some of the mill wheel structure there on the bottom of the river. Phipps established this mill about the 1880s, and it's known in my time as Phipps's Mill. The old people didn't say Phipps Mill, they said Phipps's Mill. And that's what it's been known as. Charles Johnston wrote a series of articles 
in the Star Herald beginning in 1824, describing life in Randolph County as an eyewitness. He was well into his 80s. And he, as a boy, lived on the farm right there north of the Middlebrook Bridge, where Phipps's mill was. And he remembered the Union Army patrol coming, driving off all their livestock, getting all their meat, and leaving them destitute. And the next year, according to Charles Johnston's narrative, was one of the coldest on record, and it details how difficult it was and what struggling they did to survive. Thinking about the Confederate States and the Foshi River Valley, Charles Johnston's father was Lewis Burton Johnston, a Confederate officer who was captured and spent most of the war in a Union prison. Is buried at Siloam Cemetery. <coughs> Why would a place like the Foshi Valley in Randolph County have been solidly Confederate? They would seem to have had a little stake in the Confederacy, but let's reflect on some things that maybe not generally known. In 1850, the population of Randolph County was 12% slave. One out of eight persons here were enslaved in 1850. The Jarrett family, the Martin family, the Biggers, the Plots, the Shavers had a great many slaves in, in the early days. My ancestor John Shaver's will is still on file at the Randolph County Courthouse. And when he died, he had nine slaves and he had assigned a dollar value to each one of them and apportioned that to his descendants, even breaking down what a part interest in one of these slaves would be. In my time, I find that appalling that a human being could assign a dollar value to another human being, but that's the way it was in this time and place. There's <clears throat> considerable conflict in recent years about how we should represent history. Some want it cleaned up a good deal and unpleasantness taken out of it. I don't agree with that. I think we ought to tell history as accurately as we possibly can, and the things that were wrong, learn from them. Don't be apologetic, admit they were wrong, and try to learn from it. I see no point representing it different than what it was. Second point, the people here felt like they were invaded. This was their home, and when the Union Army came here, they were invading our homeland, the way they looked at it. Also, most of our people in the Foshi Valley came from the older southern states east of the Mississippi. They still had kindred back there, and they identified as being Southern people. Also, there was loyalty to Arkansas as a state. Arkansas had seceded, and state sovereignty was very much an issue then. Many felt that states had the right to go whatever route they wanted to. Of course, the Civil War basically settled that, and it settled it the right way. We don't need states going which way they want to go. But that was the prevailing thought then. In my researching the Civil War soldiers of the Foshi River Valley, I have not found a single Union soldier. They were all Confederates. This is true of most of Randolph County, but not as solidly as it is in the Foshi Valley. There was only one pocket of pronounced Union sentiment in Randolph County, and that was the Maynard Supply Area. Now, they were by no means in a majority there, but there were a number of <coughs> Union soldiers from that area. And if you're going to understand Randolph County politics, not now, but the way it has been, 
from the Civil War up to, say, 1970, you have to understand this fact. If a family had a strong Republican tradition, that meant they were descended from a Union soldier or a Union sympathizer. The Fowlers, Brooks, and Dismangs in the Maynard Supply area are descended from Union soldiers, and in all the generations since, they have been staunch Republicans. <coughs> When you find families that have an unshakable democratic tradition, the Shavers and Spikes come to mind that correlate with our family, they were descended from a great many Confederate soldiers. The politics, of course, is much blurred now as compared to what it was in the preceding generations. But when you're assessing the politics of the old families in Randolph County, if you find a staunch generation after generation Republican family, they are nearly all, if not all, descended from Union soldiers or Union sympathizers. And those who are the most vociferous about being Democrats are nearly all descended from Confederates. Continuing down the river from Middlebrook, the next hole is called the Buffalo Hole. Now, whether that's because of a fish or a bison, I don't know. In the earlier days, there were actual buffalo here when the pioneers first got here. I su suspect it's the buffalo fish. The next hole is the Jack Rock Hole, which is on the present Doyle Reddy place. One of my partners in floating Foshi River, Andy Jones, is back here, and I want to tell an anecdote about him. <laughs> There is an old river run that intersects the Foshi on the Doyle Reddy place. I had floated past that point and cast a bass lure at least 40 years. The second time I took Eddie Jones past that point, he caught a bass that would easily have weighed eight pounds, by far the biggest I ever saw come out of Foshi. I don't know if it's clean living or what it was, or just, you know, it just the Almighty thought that somebody ought to give me my comeuppance. But I never caught one much more half that same. Second time the boy saw the place, he caught a monstrous bash. Grossly unfair, but that's what happened. The Haley Ford is the next ford of any note down the river. The Haley family came in the 1880s from Rutherford County, Tennessee. There are many, many Haley stories. Most center around a bachelor named Mont Haley. And some of you have heard of Mont Haley, but I don't see any here who wouldn't know him. Brian Homer would have known who he was anyway. He was one of my father's dearest friends. They grew up together. He and an old maid sister named Evelyn, they called her Eveline, lived in an isolated little valley between Maynard and Middlebrook. The name was William Beaumont Haley, but he was known as Mont. Well, Mont slept on a screened-in porch summer and winter. Sometimes he'd rake the snow off his covers in the wintertime. Mont was a rough and tumble backwoodsman. He was afraid of neither man nor beast in the daylight. But the sounds of the night could spook him immediately. Mont heard something squall out in the woods one night. And here's what he said. He said, Evelyn, bring me my gun, one shell, and a light, and prop that door back. <laughs> A group of people were sitting around a pot bellied stove in winter, wasn't much to do on the farm. They got to talking about their favorite foods. Well, one liked beef steak, one liked pork chops, one liked catfish. Mont said, now you take wild onions and cold grease. That's mighty good to me. <laughs> I tell you, they were, the Haley's were a unique set of people. Mont butchered a razorback boar hog once with the aid of his dogs and a rifle. They had to hunt him down and kill him. 
He told my dad, he said, Quimby, there's some of the best meat I ever ate. Said the man could eat a whole pan of cornbread with one slice of the bacon. <laughs> One other that I hesitate to tell in one sense because it involves Catholicism, Republicanism, and Communism. <laughs> uh, I have enough Catholic and Republican friends in this county. I think I can get away with that part. As far as the communistic influence, I'm still a Democrat, so I'm suspected of being a communist anyway. Just put that out on the table. But anyway, we lived for a while in Rockford, Illinois, and when we came back, we'd go visit Mom. Well, Mom was sitting on the porch, and he said, boys, the thing sure is in a mess in Washington, ain't they? Well, at any given time, you know, you'd have to agree with that statement then or now. He said, they tell me everyone up there is either a Catholic, a communist, or a Republican. <laughs> Mark could not have defined any of the three, but he knew they were not of his culture, and he had been warned against them. The classic attitude of his time. The Wilson Ford is the next down the river. That's named after Don Wilson's ancestor, Cecil Wilson. I will never forget a conversation on Uncle Lewis Wilson's porch, 1949. My dad and I were sitting talking with Uncle Lewis Wilson in the old dog trout house. It's on what's called Feaser Loop now. Yeah. You might remember Red where that house burned on the left yeah. around that loop. That's the old Lewis Wilson place. Anyway, talking about World War II, Uncle Lewis said, boys, old Hitler ain't dead. <laughs> said, they've got him hid out over in them German hills. Hesitated a moment, and he said, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if they ain't got old Kaiser Bill hid out too. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot imagine if you're much younger than me and didn't live in our back hills here, how isolated our people were and how limited their concepts were of a larger world in recent generations. Now to Uncle Lewis Wilson, if it was across the waters, as they put it, it was under suspicion. <laughs> and he'd had to send the body to believe that Hitler was dead. He thought the threat still existed. The Carroll Ford is the next down the river. Joe and James Carroll's ancestors, one of them named Solomon Carroll, was a Confederate soldier. Jake's great-grandfather, also named Jake Foster, and a man named Elijah Forrester, were exchanged in a prisoner exchange during the Civil War. And they walked from someplace in Illinois back to Columbia Jail. When they crossed the Mississippi at Cairo, they crossed on a log raft. And the thing was 40 miles wide. Quite a story. Now because of a flood? The rain was a lot? Yeah, it was at flood stage. There was one more I intended to tell. I'm not sure if I've got it down here or not. Maybe it'll come to me. The Jarrett Ford is the next one down the river. The Jarrett family was much involved in the Civil War. Dr. William brought the family here in about 1820. And if you look on the Arkansas State Capitol ground, there is a list of War of 1812 veterans, and William Jarrett is listed there. His son's name was Henry Conway Jarrett, who was the one for whom our Conway Jarrett in our generation was named. Well, Henry Conway was an officer in the 15th Missouri Confederate Cavalry. While he was away in the cavalry, the Union Army Patrol raided the Jarrett Plantation. They roughed up the women and children and uh, carried off all the horses and the meat and everything that they could. 
As Conway Jarrett told me the story, his great-grandfather came in on furlough just after this occurred. He said he rounded up a posse of the neighbors and they took after him, was the way he would have said it. He said, I always asked my grandfather Jim Jarrett and my uncle Joe Jarrett, well, what happened then? And the answer was always the same. Son, they come back with the horses. <laughs> the Foster Ford, named after Jake's ancestors, is just south of Highway 328. I won't go into a lot of Foster history because I think Jake has told you a lot about that. We'll close with our travel log going down the river at Martin Spring and the Hang Holler. There was a slave rebellion in Randolph County in 1861. There was a slave named Bird Mark. Slaves generally took the last name of their owners. And a woman named Louisa Mark owned a slave named Bird. There was a man from the north named Percival and a local man who was a cousin of the Shavers and Marks named Fletcher. Henderson Fletcher, that entered into a conspiracy with a number of slaves in different places. They were to rise up on a given night, kill their masters, and steal all they could, and go north. Well, Henderson Fletcher got drunk and revealed the plot. Well, they gathered at the Martin Plantation. This is Ann Carroll's great-grandparents on the road between Stokes and Jerry, right about where Gene Weisenbaugh lives now, is, was where the Martin Plantation was. Well, it's a brutal story, but here is what happened according to Charles Johnston, who was there and saw it. They gathered up all the slaves in the county and most of the other population at Judge Martin. They beat slaves for a week. They'd bend them over a log and beat them unmercifully till they were sure they got the truth out of them about the plot. Then they hanged Bird Mark and Percival, letting Henderson and Fletcher slip away during the night. I don't know primarily because he avoided the rebellion or he was family and they just had to let him go. I don't know. Some interesting things about that story. It was said by those present that they thought it wasn't fair that they hung the only slave Louisa Mark had and all the wealthy slaveholders got to keep all of this. <coughs> no concern about the man being hanged. The concern was the dollar value that Louisa Mark lost out of. I have no doubt, I had many ancestors that were in the crowd because the Condits and the Shavers and the Waddles and the Biggers all lived in the Foshi Valley. I have no doubt they were there. They well have everyone approved of it. I don't know. But it is a part of our history. when I think of the fact that one human being can own another. Having said that, I have three ancestors in the Confederate Army, a great many other corollary relatives that were in the Confederate Army, and many of my ancestors here and in the older states of the South were slaveholders. I think one can honor one's Confederate heritage without being a racist. I may be in the minority thinking that because I don't think I am a racist to any degree whatsoever. I wasn't raised to be. My mother and dad would backhand you if you said something <coughs> cruel about a black person or anybody else at a disadvantage. They just didn't tolerate that. At the same time, those who were in the Confederate Army thought they were defending their homeland. And to them, they were doing the right thing. I think we can honor what they tried to do without upholding slavery 
or trying to argue that slavery was the right state of affairs. It was not. And I am appalled that my ancestors were a part of it, but then they were like everyone else here at that time. That's the way it was in this time and place. Well, let's review a little what we've said about the Foshi Valley. What our people generally don't realize is that we were a seedbed for the settlement of the Old Southwest. When the people came out of the eastern states after the Louisiana Purchase, the Foshi Valley was the first place they came to that was hospitable for agriculture <coughs> and a great many well-known people in central Arkansas, south Arkansas, Texas lived in Randolph County in the valley of the Foshi for a long time before they moved on. We'll close by talking about kinship connections. John Shaver had six children that married six children of Jesse Johnson. I am descended from John Shaver and Jesse Johnson both. I've thought about that, and it may be that's a reason why none of us has ever amounted to much of anything. <laughs> but I won't say that for fear of offending some of my distant cousins. <laughs> However, I would give this one piece of advice. If you ever run for office against someone with roots in the Foshi River Valley, be very, very careful. The odds are pretty strong that if you're talking to a member of one of the older families, you're talking to a cousin, one degree or another, because it's that kind of place. Our people have been here for 200 years in some cases. They've interacted and intermarried during all that period of time. And we're still somewhat like a clan, some of us, and uh, actually still a little suspicious about things from all. <laughs> well, I'll quit there and let anybody ask a question if they want to. I got a question. Yes, sir. If it took you six days to float down the Foshi River, what'd you do those five nights? I didn't say I did it all at one time. Oh. <laughs> but I've done it at various times. Was there mosquitoes? Not bad. <clears throat> Carol Ann said that she wouldn't float Foshi or even walk the bank because she heard there were snakes there. <laughs> well, Water she, they, they were there and are now. I've had them fall in the boat at night. That's quite a sound. <laughs> a soft sound behind you on the floor of a boat. It kind of engages your attention. <laughs> yes, sir. I read in... Uh, one of your books about the red horse running out of the mouth of the creek. They still do that there? They do. They do. I, I wish I would. That made me think of the story I was going to tell. That's it. It's a red horse story. The red horse sucker is a very esteemed fish in the Foshi Valley culture. You don't find them in the lowlands, at least you don't find them spawning like they do on the Foshi. The tradition is that when the dogwood tree is in full bloom, the red horse sucker will be on the shoals. And it just simply caused the fishing fraternity in places like Palestine and Brakeville and Vernon and Jet, Warm Springs, Ingram. They just stayed nervous until they found out exactly when the red horse got on the shoals. And it was unerring. When the dogwood was in full bloom, they would be there. I've never seen it fail. But what you did was you mounted a light over the front end of a boat. One man stood up in the front with a gig, and another paddled the boat down the river and kept it straight while you punched at these fish going over a swift shoal. This was not technically legal. <laughs> but it was a centuries-old hill country tradition. One night, Lonnie Williams and I were floating from the state line to Middlebrook, and I had just been out of the boat 
uh, thrown my gig at a red horse and had to chase it down. I got back in the boat. Both my knee boots were half full of water. Went over the last shoal above the Middlebrook Bridge and a hot wire got me right under the Adams Act. It had been stretched across the river to keep the cattle from crossing. Well, I was just standing there kind of going like that with the alternating current. <laughs> Lonnie, Lonnie had some leather gloves, and he came up and took that wire off of me. I might have been spinning yet if he hadn't done that. Well, I knew that this story would get to the Maynard Cafe. Just as well fess up and beat them to the point. So I told him, oh, everybody guffawed, as they will when they have you at a disadvantage, except Alfred Curry. Alfred did not even chuckle. It was years before I figured out that Alfred had stretched the hot wire. <laughs> now, he escaped mayhem for three reasons. He's a good Democrat. <laughs> he goes to the same church that I do, and I'm really very fond of the man. One other red horse kicking story. I think this was also with Lonnie. We uh, were floating under the Middlebrook Bridge. There was a log all the way across the river that you had to poke the boat over, and then the man in the back had to stand on the log and then push the boat on down into the swift water. Lonnie was in the front, and I was in the back, and I stood up, got on the log, and I was holding the boat. And the current would carry it out and bring it back. And I'm on my hunkers here on the log. Someone drove up on the Middlebrook Bridge and stopped, turned out the lights. Again, this was not technically legal. <laughs> Lonzo and I knew that, but we just wanted to go so bad we went anyway, get to the bottom of the matter. And I sat there on my hunkers, let the boat go out, I pull it back, boat go out, I pull it back. It seemed like an hour, it was probably 15 minutes, that the sound of tires on gravel as they departed was a great blessing. <laughs> I don't think it was a game warden. I would think it was some of our buddies that knew we were there and couldn't resist having some sport at our expense. I grew up in a community that was somewhat unique. My father once said that Palestine was the only rural community in existence where it was normal behavior to tie the team in the field and go to the river when the red horse showed or the catfish were spawning in hollow logs. And that is the culture I grew up in. And to tell you the truth about it, I'm not, as we would say in these hills, plumb over it yet. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, didn't we used to have some cousins that would make the trip from Rockford, Illinois, down here when the red horse was showing? Yes. They... For that and also for when their kids were going to be born. Yes. They wouldn't let him be born there. Uh, my cousin, Eddie Long, got married and he's 18 years old and moved to Rockford, Illinois for a factory employment, as a lot of people did here in the early 50s. But every time one of his child was to be born, he sent his wife back to Grover Milam, so her father was Stokes. He did not want Illinois on the birth certificate of one of his children. <laughs> and this same man and his brother and his father, the Hubert and Rayford, the Eddie Long family, Brian and members as well, would plan their vacation every year around April 18th, because that's the best guess when the Red Horse would be shoaling on Foshi River. You cannot imagine what a wild sport that was. You could hear them before you could see them. There'd be 20 to 40 big fish with their red tails up out of the water, splashing and carrying on. And then when you got close enough to see them, those big white noses would come up under that light, and you had about two seconds to allow for speed, depth, and the angle of refraction if he's going to hit one. It wasn't nearly as simple as it seemed. But it was a hill country tradition of long standing, and I truly do miss it. Anybody else? Well, 
taste like? I'm sorry? <laughs> Where do they taste like? Oh, delicious. They're very good. If you ever eaten a buffalo, similar to a buffalo. Very good fish. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so you're talking about the, when the red are showing on the creek, the yellow suckers are showing. Right. That was another. An equal event. It's oh, important. Yeah. Now that you've said that, I'll, I'll tell another story about one of our Shaver kindred. <laughs> a man named Uncle Rob Shaver, who was married to my grandfather Condit's sister, Franny. Rob was a distant cousin and also married to uh, my grandfather's sister. We were kindred in two ways. Very excitable man. And Max was talking about the yellow sucker shoaling in Mud Creek. Well, Rob was a staunch, solid member of the Palestine Church. But as I explained to your cousin Carl Harris once, Eddie, Palestine Church of Christ folks a little bit different than the standard down Highway 115 type. They were they hung a little looser. But anyway, the, the yellow suckers went up over a shoal, and Uncle Rob thought they were going to escape. Jumped in the creek. In hot pursuit, had his gig handle crossways as he ran up to the creek. Every time his feet hit the bottom, he'd make a colorful statement. <laughs> and he ran between two bushes and snapped off both ends of his gig handle without noticing. Went on out of sight, addressing the fish very personally and very vehemently. And he came back and he saw what he'd done. He said, well, fiddle, fellas, fiddle. The good Lord don't hold a man responsible for what he says while he's a fish and know how. <laughs> for the sake of many of my ancestors and kindred west of Foshi River, I hope Uncle Rob was right. <laughs> um, that was very good. Well, thank you. Just wonderful. Yeah.